ਵਾਹਿਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਕਾ ਖਾਲਸਾ ਵਾਹਿਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਕੀ ਫਤਿਹ ਥੈਂਕ ਯੂ एवरीवन ਫॉर ਜੁਆਇਨਿੰਗ ਟੁਡੇਸ ਵੈਬਨਾਰ ਹੋਸਟਡ ਬਾਈ ਸਿਕ ਰਿਸਰਚ ਇੰਸਟੀਚਿਊਟ ਮਾਈ ਨੇਮ ਇਜ਼ ਗੁਰਵਿੰਦਰ ਸਿੰਘ ਐਂਡ ਆਈ ਵਿਲ ਬੀ ਹੋਸਟਿੰਗ ਐਂਡ ਮੋਡਰੇਟਿੰਗ ਟੁਡੇਸ ਸੈਸ਼ਨਸ ਦ ਪ੍ਰੈਜੈਂਟੇਸ਼ਨ ਵਿਲ ਬੀਗਿਨ ਸ਼ਾਰਟਲੀ ਬਟ ਬਿਫੋਰ ਵੀ ਗੈਟ ਸਟਾਰਟਡ ਆਈ ਵਾਂਟ ਟੂ ਰਿਵਿਊ ਅ ਫਿਊ ਹਾਊਸਕੀਪਿੰਗ ਇਸ਼ੂਜ਼ ਐਂਡ ਲੈਟ ਯੂ ਨੋ ਹਾਊ ਯੂ ਕੈਨ ਪਾਰਟਿਸਿਪੇਟ ਇਨ ਟੁਡੇਸ ਵੈਬ ਇਵੈਂਟ I'll provide some information about Sikh Research Institute and today's presenter Manpreet Singh before turning it over for the main presentation. What you're looking at is an example of GoToWebinar attendee interface. It's made up of two parts, the viewer window on the left which allows you to see everything the presenter will share on the screen and the control panel is on the right. click the orange arrow to open and close the control panel and the audio pane provides audio information by default you would have joined the webinar by mic and speakers but you can also join it by telephone and use the telephone if you prefer and the dial in information will be displayed which also includes an audio pane you can send your questions either by typing in your the questions panel or by ask it over the mic in case you don't have a mic please state your name city and uh, questions in the questions panel and you can always send uh, your questions while the session is in progress uh, and i'll pass them on to the presenter manpreet as a reminder today's webinar is being recorded and everyone will get an email within 7 days with a link to view the recording if for any experience you uh, if for any reason you experience technical difficulties during the session you and you can't see the main presentation please don't hesitate to contact me via the chat panel if you do lose your uh, internet connection or have to restart your computer you can always rejoin it by using the original uh, confirmation email web address finally at the end of the presentation i will launch a testimonial and feedback window and we'd appreciate it if you can take a few minutes to provide your feedback and comments on how the session went and also how we can improve future sessions also provide some background on the institute and manpreet singh Sikhi connects people with teachings of Sikhi and strengthens the bonds of Sikh community around the world by offering courses and seminars in a variety of mediums. Sikhi has published a number of books, Thank You Why Guru, Guru Granth Sahib, Its Language and Grammar, Sikh Faith and Followers, My Gurmukhi Khazana. All Sikhi products are available for sale on sikhri.org and they can be ordered on Facebook as well. Now I'd like you to to introduce our presenter Manpreet Singh has been a volunteer at Sikri since we started he is also the host of Sikri podcast and works as director of marketing for a financial firm and currently lives with his wife in Long Island New York and now without further ado i'd like to pass it over to Manpreet Singh to begin today's presentation Hey, Vaigurji ka khasa, Vaigurji ki pate. My name is Manpreet Singh. Uh thank you for the introduction, Gurvinder. You are uh, investment and Sikh. Thank you. And investment and Sikhi. So, um I know this is kind of not like I guess the run of the mill topics for Sikh Research Institute. Uh but I think it's even in today's environment, it's probably very uh timely and uh to get education on this just as Sikh in America. And I apologize if anyone uh in this webinar is uh, outside of America most of the principles and terms are American here but there are different types of investment principles that you could take anywhere in the world um and so just to give background on this so just to put some disclaimers out there uh before I start um I want to let everyone know I'm not a financial advisor like Ravinder mentioned I I'm a marketer I've been in marketing for most of my career 
Um, I used to be a marketing, uh, I used to be a director of marketing at a technology research firm, and now just recently I'm at a financial firm doing uh, marketing there. But um, uh, you know, so I'm not a financial advisor. I don't sell anything I'm not, I'm not, or anything like that. What got me interested in this was that I uh, I got married uh, over four years ago, and before that I didn't really know about money, how money works, how I could invest, how I could you know. Um, how I could uh, be well off in the future and how, you know, you can create wealth. And I didn't know anything about that. I used to, you know, just spend my money like everyone else, not, not you know, worry about my future, not where, where it's going, not who is advising me if they're if they have my best interests at heart or not, which I'll get into in this presentation. So when I, when I was getting married and when I got married, I just started studying every single thing I can about investing. Um, I, I went, you know, this was, um, I went to, uh, of course, the Internet's a great source, but I've read so many books. I listened to so many lectures on investing by the greats. So this is, um, I know this presentation is about an hour, hour and a half, and we're going to give you the basics here. But, um, you know, I've learned so much from so many people, and I've just uh, boiled some main principles down for everyone on this webinar. Um, uh, so um, I, I just want to let you guys know this is all for education purposes, and this is all for – these are just facts that I'm going to talk about. These are not going to be my opinions. When it is, I'll let you know. Uh, but these are just facts and math and how we can get started. So I just started – you know, I started taking my time. And when I learned everything and I realized all the misconceptions I had and how to really do it, I started teaching other people. I started, and like I said, I'm in marketing, but I wanted to let other people know. So I wanted to let my family members know, hey, by the way, do you know if you're doing this uh, type A action, you actually should be doing type B and C. Um, and I started uh, helping my friends out and I started helping my cousins out and, uh, you know, my, my, uh, my nuclear family and, and everything like that. And, you know, as part of, of course, as six, we have this fund. So this was part of my, this fund is also giving my time to something that I really know. Uh, and then I can teach people. So that's just my, uh, disclaimer for, uh, for today's, uh, webinar. Um, all right, so let's get started. Um, so this is the agenda. It seems like a lot. Um, you know, we'll do some sick inspiration in the beginning, but then I'm going to get into why you're going to, why, why invest in the first place? What's the best way to think about investing? We'll talk about some basic definitions. We'll talk about stock market misconceptions because there's a lot of stock market misconceptions in our community, at least the Sikh community and overall the Punjabi community and the immigrant community that is here in America. Uh, we'll talk about the rule of 72, power of compound interest dollar cost averaging and paying yourself first, which is one of the key principles in this, asset allocation. And then after we learn about all the, all the basics and how money works and stock market and things like that, so what do you do next? Where to invest? And what's the best company to invest with? Uh, you know, why do fees matter? Why life insurance is not an investment? What funds you really need? What funds you don't need? Some investment accounts that you should be familiar with? especially if you're in corporate America these days, and then we'll do a Q&A at the end. Okay, so let's start with some sick inspiration. And for me, it's always the basics, because I think, you know, a lot of people, when it comes to, uh, you, you know, Sikhi in my life, everyone wants to talk, you know, in Sikhi 101, just getting that right is so, is so big. And so, you know, uh, when we're three, four years old and we're in um, – we are in uh, Gurdwara at the Gurdwara classes. You know, we learned uh, three three principles of Nam Jap Nakas Karni Vanke Shakna. So this is just, uh, so for this presentation, we really want to focus on Kirt Karna, earning an honest living, Vanke Shakna. So how do we share our wealth uh, for the benefit of others? Um, and then this is a, a line I got from, uh, I guess, one of my mentors, of um, you know from Gurbani and it's it's just the last two lines but the whole whole hymn uh, really talks about or the whole Shabbat really talks about how people are basically if I'm loosely translating it now um, how people are selling out just to make it just to make money you know or people are selling out just to be lazy but to earn a living you know and uh, Guru Nanak says you know Kal Kai Kichhaton De Nanikra Pachane Se 
So basically it's talking about, you know, earning a rightful living. And if you earn a rightful living, that's when you could, that's what you should eat from and that's what you should give. And that to someone that knows the true value of this. So I want you guys to keep that in mind. You know, there's a lot of other religions, you know, there's Judaism, there's uh, Islam that talks about that have codifications for what to do with interest and finance. And we don't really have that as much as I know uh, my understanding of the Gubani, which is not that much, but, uh, and we don't have that, you know, our thoughts are very sovereign and our thought is very, you know, ethics. It all comes down to ethics and doing the right thing. And if you're doing stuff ethically and you're having people's interests at heart, um, you are doing this through a sick lens. So when I'm going through this, uh, that is my overall theme, is my overall theme is ethics on this. Um, and so I want you guys to think about that. I want you to think about while we're talking about these things and how uh, a six should look at um, investing in this day in this day and age. All right, so let's get in started. So why invest, right? Why why do people invest in the first place? And there's so many reasons people invest. There's so many reasons, but the number one reason and what it all comes down to, no matter all the books you read or whatever, is income. And that's ultimately uh, why people are investing. They're invest investing for a sense of income to give them financial freedom. So that's like anything, and you know, I mean, let's take the biggest investment or so-called investment that people make in their lives, right? They make, they buy a house, right? And uh, in our community and six and even, you know, back in Punjab, property is a big deal. And people, uh, you know, and that's, that's because as they know at the end, that's like their retirement plans. They know at the end when it's paid off, whatever, they can do something with it. They could sell it, they could downsize, they'll have, you know, they could rent it. It'll be, a, it'll be for income. So that's, that's the number one reason why you should invest. And there's all these other reasons that people have, but uh, that is the main reason. And the best way to think about investing. So it's savings for the future is, is definitely how you want to invest. This is not, I'm not going to be talking about trading. This is in investing. You know, we're not day trading here. We're not, uh, we're, we're not buying something low uh, today and three days later we sell it for a quick gain. That's not what I'm going to talk about. So if you're on this webinar to learn those things, I'm sorry. This is more for a solid behavioral long-term view on investing. You know, and that's why I have that picture there. You know, just you're just putting the seeds in now. You know, there's and and you'll hopefully it'll grow into something fruitful uh, when, when when it's time to to bear its fruit, right? So the best way to think about it is take a long-term approach. You're saving for the future, uh, and hopefully your money's creating money. And you're investing in something. You're not trading. You're investing your time and you're investing your hard-earned money. Um, and you want to see it grow and, and do good. So investment behavior. And this is one of the main key points on investment behavior. So Benjamin Graham was great. Um, you know, this is like Warren Buffett's mentor, right? He's, he wrote The Intelligent Investor and about a value investing. You know, and it all comes down to it's okay. I could tell you exactly where to put your money and don't look at it for 30 years. But real investing and behavior, and I want you to think about this on the thick lens too, that it's, it's about your behavior, right? It's about what you do and your emotions and your mind. You know, Gabani teaches you how you should, you know, you need to, you know, 90, 95% of Guru Granth teaches you how to control the mind, right? And so this is what, and same thing in investing, you want to control your emotions. A large part of investing involves investor behavior. So the emotional processes, the mental mistakes, the individual personality traits that we have, all, uh, all, all are geared towards and complicit with your investment decisions. So Benjamin Graham uh, had individuals, his famous quote is one of his famous quotes, individuals who cannot master their emotions are ill-suited to profit from the investment process. So this is one of the main, main principles, right? If anyone's in corporate America, everyone knows that it's like 80% of your behavior and how you deal with people and 20% of your technical knowledge. That's what kind of investing is too. It's even more. It's like 10% of your technical knowledge and 90% of your behavior. So behavior is very key when it comes to investing. That's why I mentioned the long-term approach because people want to look at it every day and people want to see what's going to happen next year, what's going to happen six months from now or a month from now. But uh, the market is crashing. What do I do? So those types of things, you know, that's when you want to control your emotions and behavior and think long term. 
All right, so let's talk about some basic definitions because I, I realized when I was even, uh, you know, talking to my friends and family and letting them know about certain things, looking at their 401ks and looking at where they're investing and if they're not, if they're getting hosed or not and things like that. Uh, a lot of people didn't know the basic definitions of things and what they do. So let's talk about some uh, basic definitions of a stock bond and a dividend. So a stock, and I'm, I won't read these word for word. This is just there for you guys to go and, and look back at. But a stock is essentially when, when a person says, uh, you know, stock in my company, you're buying shares of their uh, corporations on their assets and earnings. So you actually become a shareholder, which is a part owner, let's just say, of a company, right? So if you guys watch Shark Tank, people say, you know, today, you know, I'm asking for $100,000 for 20% stake in my company. That 20% stake is going to come through their assets and earnings. That's what they really mean. So you they want to be a stockholder. And if you see Mark Cuban on Shark Tank, he says, I want to be an advisor stockholder and I want to buy it at this price and all those other things, uh, you know, even if the company does well, I still want the lower stock price. So that's what a stock is. You're eventually buying shares in a corporation. So if you buy, um, let's say if you buy, and we're not really going to get into this because this is more of a broad strategy, but if you buy, uh, you know, a stock of Apple, you're an Apple shareholder, you know. So a lot of people have iPhones, a lot of people have Macs, but they might not have Apple stock, right? So that's what, that's what the mindset, uh, hopefully, by the end of this presentation, you'll see that you want to be shareholders of also the companies that you're buying in, into. So that's what a stock is, really. Um, and that's what the stock market's about. You're having, you're basically representing an ownership of a corporation's assets and earnings. So what's a bond? A bond is a debt investment, right? A bond is a debt investment in the, in the stuff that if someone gives you a loan, you're getting interest on that loan, and at the end when the loan's paid, you get your money back. And typically there's corporate and government bonds, which are highly rated bonds. So if you ever watch any news and, you know, like treasury bonds and things like that, those are very, very safe. And those are like very safe investments. Those were the safest, mostly the safest investments uh, when the stock market, you know, came crashing recently in 2008 because uh, those are government backed. So that, that's a bond and those are very, uh, those are also known as fixed, in, fixed income. So people usually in your 401k, uh, you will see, or in your mutual funds, you will see uh, a ratio, most of it always stocks and bonds ratio, and then there might be cash in, in it as well, but it's mostly stocks and bonds. And the more stocks you got, the more risk uh, risky uh, you are, the more risk you want to take because stocks go up and down. Bonds are very steady. So if you're, so, uh, you know, if the, uh, I'll just take my parents, they're in their 60s. They don't have, uh, they're not invested so much in stocks because they made that wealth. You know, when you're younger, you want to be all in stocks because you could take the ups and downs of the market because you're not going to sell or retire until 60 something. But when you are, you kind of want to be more weighted on the bond side. So if it does go to a downturn and you need that money, you're not losing that money. And that's how kind of the game is played. And a dividend. So a dividend is a distribution so uh, of its uh, earnings, right? And people love dividends because they're issued as cash payments, shares of stock. Uh, so if I have Apple stock right now, uh, let's say I have 100 shares, it pays me a 2% something dividend every quarter. So I'm making um, uh, and that dividend I could take as a cash payment or I could reinvest in my stock. So dividends are how corporations get to share their wealth with their shareholders. That's why people, a lot of people have stocks. They don't want to put it in the bank, which is giving you, you know, zero point nothing these days. They'll put it in a stock that's maybe a blue chip stock or, or, or a mutual fund that'll give them some sort of dividend, that they'll give them some sort of earnings and shares of a company when it's coming down, uh, when it's coming down to share those. That's why if you see, CNBC or you see the news or at all, they talk about quarterly earning reports. This is where the company talks about their dividend and how much they're giving back to stockholders, shareholders. Okay, so what's the fiduciary? And this is um, this is very, very key. You might be hearing it a lot, a little more because President Obama actually signed this into law that uh, in a couple of years, everyone needs to start acting as a fiduciary. And this is what the system has run amok on. This is like the corrupt system that happened. So if I relate it, and I'm not 
uh, an expert on this, but if I relate this to when Guru Amadashi started the Manji system, which was spreading Guru's teachings, and you know, Guru Harai even expanded it too, but let's, when they were spreading Guru's teachings and collecting the monetary funds, you know, it was great in the beginning, but more and more you go on, the system got corrupt. And they, 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 were, they stopped being fiduciaries to the Guru. They had their own interests at heart and what they wanted to do instead of the Guru's interests, and they started using the money uh, unwisely, let's say. So what a fiduciary really is, and this, is a, this is like the standard definition, but it's basically a person that has your interests first at heart. So your lawyer is your fiduciary. They work for you, right? You hire them to do something. They have your interests at heart. They're not looking at... Uh, you, you know, they're uh, anyone else's interest. You know, they're not looking at to capitalize on you other than the fee that they're going to charge you, right? So fiduciary basically owes owes it to owes for good faith and trust is what a fiduciary is, and that's what you want to that's what you want in anyone that is handling your money. And we'll get into that later, but. That's what is being lost these days. That's how the system got corrupt. Um, and so we'll, uh, we'll talk about that later because I have some examples. Um, and then, you know, Dow Jones and S&P 500, those are the main stock indicators that we see on the news every day. So just to, just quickly, Dow Jones is basically it's not the whole market. The market has like thousands and thousands of stocks. Dow Jones is the 30 most significant stocks, the stocks that, you know, handle the most cash mo most of the time. Uh, they're large cap. They're, they're, they have large market capitalization. So those are the 30 most significant stocks in the market. S&P 500 are the 500 largest public companies, right? There's, there's probably companies that could be in the S&P 500, but they're private. They don't have, they're not public, meaning they don't have stocks and they don't give, uh, you know, they're not traded on the stock market. They're, they're private. They don't give, uh, they don't let anyone buy their stock. So, uh, and I want you guys to remember this because this is going to come in handy later on. All right, some, some stock market misconceptions, and this is stuff I've heard all the time. And this is what I think this is what um, the community, Punjabi community, not even that, but just overall in America, you know, uh, investing in stocks is just like gambling. It requires extensive financial knowledge and experience. Uh, you can't buy stocks now because the market's doing terribly. The stock market's complicated. The stock market is risky. And those are all the misconceptions when I started. Um, you know, teaching people and I started helping people. That's, these are all the misconceptions they have. And, you know, and, and I, I want to say something here on the gambling part, because when I was doing this presentation for, for you guys today, there were people uh, on like forums and boards talking about how, um, how the stock market is gambling and six can't gamble and we shouldn't be part of the stock market. Then I realized that, you know, this person does not know what they're talking about, but they're on the forum. And I don't want people to think like that. It's not gambling is, I mean, the stock market and gambling is a huge misconception. Yes, if you are trading every single day and hoping the next, you know, hoping that the next day the stock goes up, yes, you might be gambling. Yes, you might be, you know, but the stock market is your, like I said, you're buying shares in a corporation. Right, you're buying shares. Hopefully, that corporation will do good. Hopefully, that corporation will make money. If you're in the corporate America, you might have stock options in your own companies these days. Uh, are you gambling? <laughs> you know, all the 401ks that are out there that people invest to that probably don't even know where their money is. Are they gambling? The stock market are corporations, and you're investing in them. That's how you got to think about it. You're investing in them, so hopefully, they will grow, and you will grow with them. You can ride on their experience and their business, and you could, from their wealth, you can create your own wealth. So it's not really, it's not gambling at all. It's not poker. It's not at a poker table. A poker table, there's no, there might be 10% skill, but a lot of it's luck for you to get the right cards, right? Over here is not luck. Very skill. Uh, and you need a little skill. You don't need a lot of skill, but you need to know how the game works so you could have the game work for you. Um, you know, another misconception is, uh, I would never buy stocks now because the market's doing terribly. Um, that is actually <laughs> that is actually uh, funny because that's actually when you want to buy stocks. You want to buy low, right? You don't. Do you want to go into a store 
and buy uh, something on full price, or do you want to go into a store and go to the clearance rack and buy something on sale? Where, where do most people want to go? That's how you need to look at this, and we'll talk about this later on. Stock market is complicated. Hopefully, I'll uncomplicate that for you today uh, because it's really not as complicated as people think, and the stock market is risky. Sure, um, stock market is risky. The disclaimer should be there. Yeah, stock market is risky if you're investing for three days. But we're not talking about that. Remember, you got to think long term. And in the long term, which I'll show you soon, the stock market has done really, really well. And this is just history. These are not opinions. This is just data that I will show you. Uh, and you guys could Google this. You guys could, you know, um, research yourself, which I encourage you to do. Uh, you will find the same data that I did. So these are just some of the misconceptions that um, I wanted to point out. And so this is, the, this is another chart, right? The most important chart on investing you'll ever see. I know it's a provocative title, but it's a pretty good chart because, yes, the stock market goes up and down. And what this chart is showing you basically in a nutshell is that the stock market does go up and down, but it goes up way more times than it does down. And this is from uh, the history of the stock market. So this is 1956 to uh, 2015, so December 2015, right? So this is all the years. The green is showing you all the times the stock market had a rally, also called a bull run, a bear run was, is when the stock market goes down. But this is all it's showing you. And you see that the, there's, not that many, there's not that many big red lines. You know, if anything recently that you want to see, this was a big red line right here, 52%. But what, what is this showing you? If you take a long-term view and I give you a graph, right? you will see that the stock market is going up. It will go up and down, but you, will, you can draw a line from 1957 to 2015 where it's just going up, right? And, um, uh, you know, Warren Buffett had this, uh, you know, when I was listening to one of his interviews, he's like, look, if you, uh, the stock, the Dow Jones was 66, you know, 100 or something like that, and uh, I forgot the year, but it was like somewhere in the 70s or something, or maybe the 80s. And now it's at 18,000, right? But he's like, you could make, a, you made a lot of money if you just invested in that. But if you try to jump in and out every day or all the time, you're not going to miss all that. So what, what I'm trying to show you is that the stock market will take three steps forward, but it might take a step back or two, but then it'll take three steps forward again. And so these are just, this is just the, the history from 1949 to 2015 in the S&P 500. So the S&P 500, like I said, the 500 largest companies. This is their history, and that's where you'll see the, the biggest index is that at CNBC everyone talks about is S&P 500. This gives you basically all the large companies and what they're doing, which makes up most of the market cap and uh, market capitalization in the stock market. So I just want to really show you this. When people say stock market's risky and it's complicated and all those other things, but most of the time it's going up. And what we want to do is we want to be part of this. Just like we're a part of corporate America and we buy goods and services in the economy here to boost it, we want to be part of this too uh, to help create wealth for ourselves. Okay, so the rule of 72. So this is just a quick rule. It's, uh, it's basically math where you take, uh, you know, how many years is it going to take for my investment to double? So what you do is you take whatever interest rate you're getting and you divide it by 72, that'll tell you the years. So this is just a rule to remember on how money works and how interest and compounding works. We'll get into that a little more, but just wanted to point it out. So let's say if your investment is making uh, 3% a year, it's going to take 24 years for the investment to go to 10,000 to 20,000. If it's doing 6% in 12 years, it's going to go it's going to uh, go from 10 to $20,000. If you're making 12% a year, so you just divide it, right? 72 divided by 12, that's six. So in six years, your investment will double. So this is just telling you, you really want to make sure uh, when you're early on, so this is all the people in their 30s, and I would even say 40s, really. Um, this is how you want to think about when you think about risk and how, how much uh, risk you want to take to get the percent that you want. And then you can see how money works and how much it doubles. That's why if people keep it in CDs and bank accounts, you'll see it's going to take a long time, way longer than this, your investment to double. So that's why stocks help. I don't know any um, 
you know, stock market has wealth for so many people. The richest people are in stocks. I mean, I don't have to tell you guys on the Forbes list, uh, but that's where, where they are. Uh, but I don't know any that makes this amount of a return that could be invested so easily in. So I just wanted to show you the rule that this is just math. So if you guys ever want to calculate it and, and see what's going on in your own investment, please use this rule. All right, so the power of compound interest. I've got two slides on this, I think. Um, so compound interest is, this is for a penny. So um, and, and when I, when I was younger, I think in middle school, you know, the teacher had a question, would you take in our, like fifth or sixth grade, the teacher had a question, if I give you a mil would you take a million dollars now or would you take a penny a day and I double it every day for the next 31 days? You know, most people like myself didn't know, but like, give me the million dollars, right? And then you could see that million line. But actually, if you take a penny a day, you'll have well over $10 million when it's all said and done. The reason I'm showing this chart is the power of compound interest, but also it takes a long time. That's why the long-term view, like I said, you know, you'll see the, the chart does go up like a hockey stick, but it goes up at the end, right? So it takes a while to create that wealth and to build the momentum. But once it starts going, it's a powerhouse. All right, the power of compound interest in terms of saving early. So th this is a great chart because it shows you the power of saving early mixed with the power of compound interest. So if we just go through this real quick, Susan invests 5,000 annually. So she invests 5,000 every year from 25 to 35. She invests $50,000. Bill invests 5,000 between 35 and 65. In total, he invests $150,000. Chris does 5,000 between 25 and 65. So total principal he invests is $200,000, right? But Susan comes out ahead because she started 10 years early and she only invested $50,000. And if you see her chart, she ends up with 1.1 million. I think this is the growth rate. Um, I think it might be between, uh, I think it might be like seven or 8% or something like that. So it's between eight and 10%. Um, <clears throat> so she gets 1.1, but the person who starts late, so if you start 10 years late, but you invest triple the amount, you still won't make it and catch up to Susan. You only got around 600,000. And um, and uh, Chris uh, or uh, Bill only got 540,000, right? So Chris got 620 because he invested 200,000. Bill got 540, but Susan, and by investing early and letting compound interest work for her, like I said, building that momentum, just like the penny a day, building that momentum, she comes out early. So. One of the key takeaways, what I'm showing you is the earlier you start, the earlier you teach your kids about things. You know, I teach my cousin. My cousin started his job, a really good job. He started at 24, 25. I told him, invest now. I know you want to spend the money. I know this money is good and you want to go out. And so I'm like, still do that. I'll teach you a way to how you can do that. I'll teach you a really good way to do that. But start investing now and you will thank me in 10, 15 years I'll, that you'll be like this. Like Manpreet, that is the best advice I ever got. Because earlier you invest, the longer your money gets to compound, and then you'll see those returns by the time you want to take it out or the time you retire. So let me just get a sip of water. All right, so dollar cost averaging is another principle, right? Dollar cost averaging, if everyone has a 401k, uh, you'll get this right away because you dollar cost average every time you get a paycheck money goes to your 401k right your dollar cost averaging in you're investing the same amount every month every week whatever you want <clears throat> um, into into purchasing the same amount of shares in a in, in a mutual fund right let's just say a mutual fund not a stock because that's how most most people if you don't know anything most people invest in mutual funds. If you do not know anything about stocks and don't want to put in the time and research on and buying individual stocks, then most people, I mean, that's what most of America does, invest in mutual funds, right? So invest the same amount every month and you're buying it. The mutual funds go up and down too, but you're buying the average. Cause, so uh, uh, I'll show you on a chart how it looks like, but you know, 
avoid, this helps you avoid following the crowd, jumping in and out of the market when it's high and low. Uh, you're just putting, if it's low, you're putting it in. If it's high, you're still putting it in. It's automatically set up. And odd, being automatic is one of the key principles that, that you want to do. Your life is so much easier. I mean, there's even a book called by David Bach, The Automatic Millionaire, and that's all these people did. These people made you know, the combined couple made less than a hundred grand, but in 30, 40 years ended up with millions just because they made it automatic. You didn't have to think about it. And in these days, everything is digital and on your phone, it should be automatic. Um, yeah, so that's dollar cost averaging. So this is how it looks like, right, by the numbers. So basically when the stock goes high, you're purchasing less shares. So let's say the blue line is the share price and the shares purchase is the green line. So when the the share price goes high, you're putting in the same amount of money, right? You're putting in the same amount, whatever it is, 100 bucks, let's say whatever. You're, the amount of shares you're buying is low because now the stock price is high, right? But when the stock price goes low, like right here, the share pr purchases are, uh, are higher. So when the stock price is low, you're purchasing uh, more shares. When the stock price is high, you're purchasing less shares. And the whole thing is, if you do this for a long period of time, you're just dollar cost average. You're basically going to get the average in, in the next 20 years of what the cost should be, which in, avoids you jumping in and out of the market, uh, which, which helps you build wealth and helps you purchase shares for the long run that actually work in your favor. And dollar cost averaging, if anyone has a 401k, that's what you're doing. You're dollar cost averaging every day, uh, every time you, know, you get a paycheck. Uh, no matter where the market is, you're putting money in. Okay, so paying yourself first. This is a principle I learned, which I, I, I think is very key as well. You know, you get a paycheck, and so the government pays themselves first, right? Because when you get your paycheck, money is gone, right? The government is taking their money. There is federal tax, state tax, Medicare, all that stuff is gone because the government pays themselves first. Right. If you have a 401k, you, you are kind of paying yourself first because you're, before you get that paycheck, the money is going into the 401k. So this is how basically I have uh, how you should set up automatically so how you could pay yourself first. And so the real principle on, on this is that after you get your paycheck, after the government takes theirs, you put it in your 401k and your medical and all that other stuff, you get your paycheck automatically. And this, this is what I do personally too so it's, it's a uh, this is me um, I have money going out of my bank account I have a direct deposit in my bank account and I have money going out from my bank account every week so this is me I don't recommend every week I think every week is good for me but people do it every other week people do it every month every quarter whatever it is that a chunk of it goes out to my investments right a chunk of it after so this is not retirement investments this is other investments as well uh, other mutual funds that I have, index funds that I have, they go in there automatically, and then some goes into my savings. So th this is this is basically a budget. You know, people have budgets. How much they're going to spend for uh, X, Y, and Z. This is this is how I budget basically because I pay myself first, so I feel good. This, this so there's a little bit of emotional connection here because you get your paycheck, your investments are in, your savings are in. Then you take that money that is left over. You put it into bills, you put it into entertainment, you put it into miscellaneous, which could be donations, which I have automatic donations set up too. So I feel good. So this is like more emotional. I mean, the tech, once you get the technical part right, the emotions work for you because if you want to go out, you know, if I want to go uh, out with my wife and have a steak dinner and it costs a couple of hundred bucks, I won't feel bad because I've already done everything. I've, I've paid myself first. I put some stuff in savings. You know, after the bills are paid, whatever, I donated my money to, and now I have this money that I can go out and feel good about because I've done all the other stuff. And once you set this up automatically, just like the government does with your paycheck, once you set it up automatically, your life will be so easier. Um, and it's very, very easy to do. Uh, I will tell you once we start getting into where to invest and how to do it, you'll, you'll see how easy it really is. I mean, setting, uh, so I'll get into that later, but this is the principle of pay yourself first. This is in every single financial book I've ever read. And then so, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Tony Robbins, but Tony Robbins is a great life coach. I love him. I, he has so many good sick principles too. The guy's awesome. 
Um, he wrote this book called Money, and it's a big, thick book. It's really good. If I recommend you getting it. All the donate, all the proceeds go to Meals on Wheels, where he helps feed. He helps feed millions and millions of people a year. I mean, this guy is truly amazing. You know, that hunger that he gives people is truly, uh, it's truly amazing. And he wants to feed a billion people in, in the next 10 years. So, anyways, if you, if you want to know stuff about money, too, he has a great book where he interviews a bunch of these people and some of the principles are on it. But before he wrote that book, he said there's two main words on how rich people get rich or how you create wealth. There's two main words and those are asset allocation, right? And so this is just an allocation model. We'll go into this a little more, but you want, this is basically going to determine how risk you want to be. How, where do you want to put your money? Do you want to put it in the U S stock market, international real estate investment and trust? So those people that think real estate is good, there's actually an asset class for real estate investment trusts. I give you a lot of dividends actually. And then bonds. So the bonds are going to weigh. So this is 40% bonds, right? This is this, so this allocation would be something like for my parents, right? Which they went heavy on bonds. For me, it would probably be right now. I have zero bonds. Uh, I'm 35 years old. I have zero bonds because I could take the ups and downs of the market. I don't need the money for the next 25 years, especially in my retirement. Can't even take it out anyway. But this this is how. You, so asset allocation is very key, and these are the two main words that you want to keep in mind on how, where your money is being allocated into what funds or what asset classes. So you get the most, uh, so you could, first of all, you'll know your tolerance, but you'll, this will help your investment goals. And a lot of financial advisors, you know, this is the number one thing they'll do is how you want to determine your assets. You know, what are your goals? How risk averse are you or not? And those are the things they'll ask. So asset allocation is just something that you want to keep in mind that uh, measures your tolerance, the goals, and the, and the time frame of when you want that money. All right, so these are some little cartoons that I use. Uh, you know, so Dilbert, famous cartoon guy, uh, you know, famous cartoon strip. Uh, you know, he, and the reason I like these two is because this is how the industry works. And I'm in marketing. I know, I see everything through the lens of marketing. So uh, I, I, I kind of like these two. Um, and this is how Wall Street and this is how these big investment firms market their product. And Dilbert pointed it out, really, right? So he's like, We'll start with 10 mutual funds, we'll randomly chosen, whichever one does best. That'll be the one that we'll promote, even though if the nine fails, and we'll promote our expertise around it. And that's how marketing and the spin of investing with that certain company is done, right? And then, so you, you see Dogworth there, I'm starting a mutual fund for investors who aren't bright enough to know their alternatives. It must be a huge market, otherwise people would invest in index funds. So we'll get into index funds now. Uh, and then you see, he's like, what's an index fund? And the guy's like, so happy. Um, you know, he's wagging his tail. He can't wait to tell him because that is what most people don't know. Even John, I mean, mo most people don't know that there is this uh, alternative source out there that is for investors. Um, let me just do a quick time check here. Sorry. All right. So let's get into this. So index funds versus mutual funds. And I won't read this, but basically, an index fund, just like if, like, if you want to invest in, he's like, uh, hey, Manfred, I just want to invest in the 500 largest companies because that's what I see every day on CNBC. I see the S&P 500 index. I just want to invest in that, uh, and, and that's it, and that'll be my long-term view because I just showed you actually, right, that chart, the best chart you'll ever see on investing, how the S&P 500 index changed and all the, uh, the, the greens were so big there because uh, it goes up way more. It goes up way, way more than it goes down. But anyway, an index fund tracks an index. If you get the Dow Jones index. You could get the S&P 500 index, Russell 2000 index, all these, you know, you get a large cap index, small cap index. Hey, I just want small stocks only because small stocks are known to grow. They're riskier, but they're known at a long period of time to grow much faster. But, uh, you know, you could buy those. And the number one, and a couple of things you really want to remember on index funds, is low operating expenses and low portfolio turnover. And this makes the biggest difference in an index fund. A mutual fund is operated, it's active, it's operated by money manager, ma managers. They pick the allocation of these are the 88 stocks we want here. We want a couple of bond funds here. We want to keep some stuff in cash. And then they do, 
and it's operated by money managers who invest uh, the fund capital, the fund capital. So whatever, you know, as many investors are in that mutual fund to produce capital gains and income for fund investors. So that is, I mean, the difference is one is just, uh, you know, set it and forget it type because it's an index. Not that many stocks are going to change in an index. S&P 500 has a turnover rate of maybe 3% uh, every year, right? But the mutual fund might have a turnover rate of 50% every year, which is very, very high, which produces capital gains, which is which means it's not going to be tax efficient. you got to pay taxes on it, which means they're trying to beat the market too. So this is the main thing. You know, it's, a, it's about people want to be – the reason Wall Street does so well is uh, – um, and a lot of these hedge fund managers – are doing so well, not so much these days, but they did well, is because everybody wants to beat the market. It's a game, right? Tony Robbins named his book, you know, How to Play the Game, because it's a game, because that's what these big people want to do. They want to beat the market. They don't want the S&P 500 index return. If the S&P 500 index is 2,000 right now, or whatever it is, I'm just making it up, but let's say it's 2,000, and at the end of the year, it's 2,200. They don't want to do that. They don't want that, you know, percent of uh, of gain. They don't want that 10% gain. They want, you know, 20, 30% gain. So the mutual funds, they pick like, okay, we don't want all the stocks in the S&P 500, but we want a couple from here, a couple from there, a couple from small cap and put it all together. And we're going to try to beat the market. We're going to try to, if the market, if the S&P 500 index does 10% this year, we want to do 20%. And that's how a lot of these mutual funds are made up. And a lot, and the problem is a lot of these mutual funds are in people's 401ks too. Right, which cost them a lot of money, which I will show you. It's, it's a huge, huge difference because uh, if you just want the average return, and people think average is a bad word, but the way I put it is that you know it's hard. I mean, you you are going to become like these are the big leagues, right? So let's say if you're an NBA player, okay, if you're an NBA player and you're an average NBA player, you're not going to be LeBron James, but you're an average. You're on the bench on LeBron James team, let's say, right? You made it to the NBA. You know how many people don't make it to the NBA? There's thousands and thousands of kids every year that do not make it to the NBA. Right? But just if you're an average player, that's really, really good. So you're getting that right off the bat. You get that easily. But people want to people want to be LeBron James. So that's how the mutual funds have. Uh, that's why people go into mutual funds and people want to take their risk, skyrocket it, and pay a lot more for it, and maybe not get that return. So. This is something that you, you want to keep. I'm a big fan, and um, this is my opinion, but this is also backed up in Pick Up Any Investing Book by the, uh, you know, the biggest investing minds, Nobel laureates that are investors. They would say index fund is the number one fund to go with. Uh, John Oliver had a segment, if you watched the last, last week tonight, which I was surprised. He had stuff on investing, and uh, index funds are, are really good. Uh, any big investment, Warren Buffett has this, which I'll show you. So index funds are where I'm going to lean towards. And I want you to think about, this is where I want you to bring Siki back in, really, and, and think about the ethics of investing and uh, the ethics of investing and how to, how, how to do it that it helps, uh, how to keep fiduciary in mind and how to help people, right? So I want you to keep that in mind um, as we go on here and, and, and we talk about now. Uh, I think I'm going to get into uh, how we should, uh, what, what to do and how to do it now instead of, so we've got all the basics down. So let's see. All right, so John Bogle and Vanguard. So, you know, uh, before I talk about John Bogle is, you know, Professor uh, Singh had, uh, you know, he really liked Walt Whitman. Right. Walt Whitman wasn't uh, a sick, but he said that Walt Whitman had sick ideals. You know, he could be a sick. He he had the guru's ideals with him, and he really really liked him and got influenced by him. Right. So when I when I started investing and when I started to invest and I looked at all these companies and what they do, John Bogle for me through a sick angle did the right thing. If a sick opened up an investment firm, he would copy John Bogle. I mean, that's how, that's how he did it. John Bogle was getting, he was a huge investment fund manager in the 60s, in the 50s and 60s. And Wall Street realized, he realized people were getting hosed from Wall Street. He realized, you know, all these, a lot of people don't know anything. All these people are taking so many fees from the client, which I'll show you, it's mind boggling. 
soon. Uh, so many fees from the client, but not not being uh, fiduciaries to them, not having their best interests in mind, but having the fund's interest in mind. So he's like, can't do this anymore. So he started Vanguard, and the purpose was to build wealth for its clients and only for its clients. And the reason he does it, uh, and the reason how he does it, is he takes, he basically, uh, Vanguard is client-owned funds, right? So the fund shareholders own the funds, which in turn own Vanguard. So Vanguard is not a publicly traded company. All these other investment companies are. So they don't have any shareholders to answer to. They don't have any public all the stuff that all the profits they make, they put it back into the fund because the clients own the fund in terms of lower cost and operating expenses. It is the only client owned fund that I know of that you could get into. It is the only client owned fund. And I really liked it. When I saw it, I'm like, man, it's a sick, open up a business to help people create wealth and help do it the right way. They'll go. Sorry, uh, we're having some technical difficulties. So just bear with us. Hello? Can you guys hear me now? Sorry, I think my phone disconnected. Hey, no problem. Uh, glad you're back with us. Go ahead. I still hear music, Manpreet, is it? So where did I leave you guys? Sorry about that. Uh, you, you, you were last at the point where if Sikh uh, had ever started an investing firm, he would have started with Vanguard. That's... Oh, got it, got it. All right. So sorry about that. I don't know what happened with my phone. Um, something crazy. Um, uh, Go ahead. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Okay. So um, I know what happened. Okay. So. Um, if a, so if a, a six started uh, a company right now, investment company today, it would be Vanguard because Vanguard is client owned, meaning the client, the clients um, own Vanguard. They own the fund, uh, the shareholders own the fund. So if you buy one fund from them, you own that fund and in terms you own Vanguard. And that model has not been copied at all since then. Uh, Vanguard is, uh, it was a pioneer. Jack Bogle, uh, you know, when he started it, he wanted to make sure that everyone got a fair shot at the market and the market's returns because he knows it was a great way to create wealth and a great way to help, you know, lower middle class people rise up to middle and upper class. Um, and that's his whole story. I mean, he has about 10, 11 books out. All the books are great. Um, uh, Jack Bogle is, uh, is still alive uh, and he's still a pioneer at his age talking about um, how uh, how uh, 
lot of people are still getting hosed by Wall Street um, and how Vanguard is taking a lot of inflow of people's money because people are getting to realize that index funds are the way now and a lot of money is flowing through Vanguard. Um, billions and billions. The most uh, mutual fund, the, the, from all the mutual fund companies out there, the biggest inflows are going to Vanguard every single year and yet there's no copycats because, and John Bogle said this too, there's no copycats because everyone's stricken to the shareholders, right? People want, people want to be uh, uh, the, the, the people, the employees of those funds. So let, let me just take Fidelity uh, as an example, because a lot of people have Fidelity too. Fidelity has shareholders. Fidelity is a publicly traded company. Fidelity uh, has interest of Fidelity in mind to make Fidelity more money, so their stock price goes up. Vanguard doesn't have that. It's client-owned. All their profits are going back into the company and lowering the cost uh, for its uh, shareholders. So it's a very cool model that has not been copied yet. Very, I, I thought when I read this, I'm like, man, this, this guy is thinking the sick way. This guy is ethically and morally thinking about how to do things right. And now it's the, one of the top three biggest companies in the world, biggest mutual fund companies in the world. You know, and there's a lot of talk these days about corporate social responsibility. Uh, and he's one of the few I have seen, maybe the only in the Wall Street realm that has corporate social responsibility to everyone that uh, is a shareholder in its fund. So it's a remarkable story. And this is the company I'm going to talk about. This is the company where uh, personally I have, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, letting people know about. I get nothing from Vanguard. I, you know, I'm just a regular, you know, owner of their funds, nothing else. But I, I promote it to everyone that I can. I have all my money in there. I have my parents' money in there and anyone else. And this is anyone else that I know, I recommend this because this is the only model I know. And I, and I really think it has a sick angle to it of the model where it's actually for the people that – actually for the clients instead of the shareholders and, and the people and Wall Street's benefit. So. Okay. So let's talk about fees. And one of the biggest things that you guys could do today, anybody has a 401k or a mutual fund investment, is to look at your fees. And what it's called, it's called the expense ratio. And this is just part of it. There's a couple other things you need to look at, but let's, this is like the major one you want to look at, right, is the expense ratio, right? So fees do matter. I pay, more, I don't pay more than 0.05% on my stock index fund at all. That's that is very, very low. I have seen my friends and family's 401k where it's been 1%. And everyone's thinking what's, what's big 1% because 1% means nothing because you're seeing your dollar amount and you're seeing 1% fee or like whatever. But think about it. If you're, if you're let's say your, your index, let's say your fund is making 10% a year, the company's taking 1%. Are they really taking 1%? They're actually taking 10%, right? One out of 10, 10%. So that's how you really need to think about it. That's what no one talks about in Wall Street. And so what John Bogle did and Vanguard did was they wanted to make funds that are, and they could because it's an index fund. They're not doing anything. They're not actively going and trading stocks and doing all those things for you and money managers. You're just buying the S&P 500 index. Let's take that as an example. You're just buying that and letting it ride for the next 10, 20, 30 years, um, which has low operating expenses. But Fees do matter, and fees are big, and fees is, and this is everywhere these days. It's actually blew up in the last six months to eight months. Fees are everywhere these days. The fees are what are killing people's retirement portfolios. Fees are killing people's returns, uh, but people don't realize it uh, because people think, like I said, the stock market misconceptions. People think, oh, the stock market is, um, people think uh, the stock market is risky. People think, oh, the stock market uh, is you need to be a financial expert and I need a money manager and it's too complicated for me. But actually, it's really, really not complicated at all. They want to make you think it's complicated, but um, it's really not. Uh, so let me show you two examples. And this is what blows everyone's mind on, on fees and why they matter, right? So let's, let's go into, let's get, take two scenarios. This is a mutual fund fee calculator from bankrate.com. So this is all math. This is not opinion. This is just math and facts, right? So let's say you have $50,000. You're holding it for 30 years with a rate of return of 10% a year. The stock market has been given 10% a year since like 1930s, okay? 
So it's nothing, anything crazy rate of return. As people say, you can't get it and blah, blah, blah. There's, um, you go to Vanguard.com, see their funds since inception in the 70s. I was born in 81. So my whole lifetime, they've been making that much, right? But anyways, so let's say $50,000, 30 years, 10%. How much money will you have in the fund with the expense ratio? And this is just expense. This is not counting turnover and other management fee costs or anything. But let's just say expenses, total expenses, 1%. You're going to have $645,000 at the end of 30 years after you pay your expenses. So $50,000, 10%, 1% right here. At the end of 30 years, you're going to walk away with $645,000, right? Your total expenses you paid are $73,000. $73,000 and the final fund value is six forty-five. dollars Opportunity costs, what you see here, that's $153,000. That's if you didn't pay those expenses and the $73,000 went into the fund, you would have made $153,000 on that. So that's what opportunity costs is. So this is a big loss. Uh, or at least um, this is uh, everyone's saying, hey, $50,000, $645,000, I'm sitting pretty. You know, that's great. And you're not even putting money in. This is 50000 You're not putting money in every year like you would do in your 401k and other things like that. You're just putting $50,000, letting it ride, 10%, 645 So like I said in this example, I don't pay more than 0.05% on my, right? So th this is the difference now. So now, same scenario, you're paying 0.05%. How much you're going to end up with? $859,000 at the end of 30 years. My total operating expenses for 30 years is 4,477. That is my total expenses. My opportunity cost is 8,000 something. I will end up with 859. So 645 here with 1%, which is, I bet you, this is in mostly 95% of people's mutual funds or 401ks that they have. If they're not in a Vanguard index fund, right? So what's the difference? $214,000 is the difference. That's $214,000 for letting $50,000 ride, which we know we won't do because we're going to put money in every year anyway. We're putting money in our 401ks, every paycheck. We're going to start investing, like I said, automatically. So $50,000 was just an example, but this is uh, why fees matter so much. And this is how Wall Street makes their money in Wall Street because they think it's there. It's telling everyone, no, oh, it's complicated. You can't get into stocks and you can't do this. Uh, like I just said, just buy, an event, just buy a 500 index fund, with, and that is the actual expense ratio of it, 0 0.05. Uh, you're going to make out with $214,000 more. So fees are huge. Fees are everywhere these days. Even if you Google fees, all these people are writing about it. So many people are picking this up now because – uh, this is what's taken away from people's retirement accounts. And this is what, this is why, uh, you know, uh, people aren't creating as much wealth as they should be. So now if I bring it back to, to, to Siki and Vanguard and John Vogel, he did this for people, right? Vanguard has done this for people. It's client owned. They're trying to look since it's client owned and you own the funds and this is the only model out there in the world you are getting the benefit of these lower costs, which is putting more money in your pocket. Vanguard has trillions of dollars. So they're making money too. It's not like they're not making money. You know, they got buildings and employees and all that stuff too, but they're taking all their profits and their fees are getting lower. So I get, I get, um, I get an email every year saying which fees are staying the same, which went up and which went down and 95% of them go down. So their fee or stay the same or go down. So the fees, they're trying to get lower because the more people that are coming into the company, uh, the more people are sharing, the more people are becoming value holders of those shares, which is in turn making more money for Vanguard. And they take that money and they put it back into Vanguard and lower our fees. So this is why fees matter. This is something that you could do today. Look at your statement. Go into your 401k online. Everything's online these days, right? And see how much you're paying for fees. Um, cool. Let's see. Um, so I said, don't take my, I, I write blog posts on Medium, a couple of them on investing, but this is just taken straight from my blog post. So one of the things that when I started investing, I was like, all right, what does Warren Buffett do? Where is he, how does a person like me uh, get advice from Warren Buffett? And Warren Buffett has YouTube videos, buy an index fund, do this, just go ahead, buy an index fund every week, you'll do fun. I'm like, what's an index fund? 
that's the, one of the reasons I got started. But even Warren Buffett, one of the richest men in the world, in his 2013 annual shareholder letter, he says, and he's not going to put his money in his estate in Berkshire Hathaway. After he leaves, he's like, put my money basically 90% in a very low cost 500 index fund. I suggest Vanguard. It's just straight exact word for word from his annual shareholder letter. It's online if anyone wants to read it. Put 10% in short term government bonds, which is safe. So if anyone needs cash, pretty much they could take it, but 90% in 500 index funds because he believes the long term results will be superior to attained by most investors whether pension funds, institutions, and individuals who employ high fee managers. He's even aware of the cost and how the cost eat the returns. So this is what the richest person, one of the richest people in the world are going to do. When he gave advice to LeBron James on CNBC, he said the same thing. Everyone's giving him advice. Everyone's telling him to do this and buy this and take this hot tip and stock. He's like, just buy the index fund and you'll be fine. So Warren Buffett's advice for LeBron James is buying an index fund, which LeBron James could do. And I'm telling you guys today, you guys could do it as well. Opening an account in Vanguard, learning just a little bit about how to do it. I mean, if you're applying for a credit card online, if you're applying for, which I'm sure people have done, if you're opening up an Amazon account online, the same amount of time to open up an Amazon.com account is going to take the same time, amount, uh, same uh, time. To open up an account in Vanguard. This is how easy it is to get into the game right now, uh, and and then to get the get the share of the stock market. So this is all the technical stuff. Like I said, this is like kind of the tech stuff that you need. Uh, but this is what even Warren Buffett would do. He's gonna instead of Berkshire Hathaway. By the way, that's been beating the market. That's why he's so rich because he's actually one of the few people that have beaten the market consistently over long periods of time. And it's it's a one out of a thousand, one out of two thousand people. It's not it's it's from all the money managers out there. But even he, at the end, he doesn't trust anyone else. He wants to put it in an index fund too. Okay. So and so, let me talk about this because this is what a lot of people have misconceptions about. And I just want to put a disclaimer here. I'm not trying to hurt anyone's feelings uh, at all. Uh, but this is where I want you to invoke a little bit of sicky and a little bit of fiduciary and what it means to have other people's interests at heart before yours. And so think about the overall theme when I talk about this. I've seen this every, I've been a, I don't want to say victim, but I've uh, been a part of this. And uh, my family has, and a lot of my uh, cousins have, and my friends, where, you know, uh, people uh, think that, buying life insurance is an investment, which is totally, and so a couple of this is gonna be my opinion, but a couple of this facts, because you can look this up anywhere in any book, go online and Google it. I'm not gonna say anything that is, I'm not gonna say anything that is uh, not based on truth, but I do wanna to apologize to anyone out there that has this for a living, that has any you know, uncle or aunt that's in the business. I'm not trying to say, that they're bad people. I'm not trying to say that they're scammers or anything like that. I'm just trying to say that just to make sure that they're fiduciary. So a lot of people, uh, you know, when I went, they have like, oh, I have kind of an investment going in my whole life insurance policy, my cash value policy, it's also called. Um, and I'm like, what? And, uh, and you look at the returns of it. And, you know, by the end of this time, by the end of 30, 40 years, I could take, uh, you know, the money will grow from this to this, and I could take a loan against it and have it, and plus I have life insurance, pay the death benefit. I'm here to tell you guys that life insurance, you need to think about life insurance as a, as a tool, not as an investment. First of all, you got to ask yourself, why do you need life insurance? Do you need life insurance? That's what you got to have to ask yourself first. So um, that, that's one. Um, another one is it's not an investment. If a, if a life insurance agent um, at, tells you it's an investment, they can't legally, they can't because you, you open up any brochure, go to any uh, company's website that sells cash value life insurance that a lot of Punjabis and a lot of people in the sick community have, you will never find the word investment in there. I guarantee you because it's illegal to have it because it's not an investment. It just builds cash value over time which is very low, it's very high in fees, a very low return. Once you die, 99, once you die, 99% of the people only get the death benefit. So let's say you have a policy of 
uh, you have a $500,000 policy and your cash value right now is 50 grand. Uh, if you uh, unfortunately happen to pass away, you're, you're only going to get the 500 grand. You're not going to get the 50 grand that you accumulated, which is kind of weird. 99% um, of people, in my opinion, uh, and many others, but in my opinion, do not need it. Because you don't need life insurance for your whole life, right? Um, so life insurance, so let me give you an example, and it's something that you guys need to think about. It's just something that you guys need to think about. And I'll give you an example of my own life. I'm not going to talk about anyone else. So I have life insurance, but I have term life insurance because I don't want life insurance for my whole life. Term life costs one-fifth the cost a month of the same $500,000, which I'll pay 100 bucks for, let's say, a month for that a whole life insurance policy of uh, half a million, but with my term, I'm only paying 20 bucks a month, right? This is, these are just true costs. Uh, so uh, it's one fifth the cost of life, and I could use the rest of the money to do things, to invest, to donate, to whatever, because I'm using life insurance as a tool. Right now, I do need life insurance because, uh, let's say I'm gonna have kids soon, my wife, we have a little debt. If I pass away, unfortunately, if I pass away, my wife could use that money to pay off the debts, to put some money in the kids' uh, fund, to be stable herself, and blah, blah, blah. And she could do all that right now in my life, okay? She could do all that. My parents have, my parents, if they had whole life, which I got out of them and we cash out and all those things, because I'm like, why do you need life insurance, right? My parents, so this is what you want to ask. Why do your parents need life insurance? Or why, why did my parents need life insurance? Um, uh, they don't have no debt. They have a bunch of cash uh, sitting in the bank. They have stocks and bonds, and they have they have a house that's paid for. Why do my parents need life insurance for their whole life? Because the, the, when they needed it before, when they were in debt and we were trying to make it, they needed it just in case something happens. But right now, they don't need it. That's why life insurance is a tool. Life insurance is not not supposed to be there, in my opinion, for your whole life. 99% of Americans do not need it. There is some. There is 1% of Americans who have estates that will be federally taxed that are over $10 million that they use whole life insurance in the estate to uh, counter state, estate taxes. Other than that, you don't need, because I, I have life insurance, I have a 30-year level. I have a 30-year level term policy. I can cancel any time. That's 20 bucks a month. If... Um, uh, so when I don't need it, I could cancel any time. It's 20 bucks a month. And so my plan is, and so this is where you want to know your financial goals and what you want to do. My plan is that I'll have enough money in my 401k. My house will be paid off. My kids will be in college. Uh, my wife will be, my, my wife will be good. Um, and she'll have, she'll have, uh, you know, she'll have a job and we'll make money. We have money in the bank. We have money in all our investments. And we have this over, we have the surplus of cash flow. Do I need life insurance then? For me, I don't because I only need life insurance if someone's going to have a hardship if I die. But we're not going to have a hardship in 20. I mean, of course, if everything goes according to plan by the Guru's grace, I'm not going to have hardship, so I don't need it for my whole life. So this is what you want to think about when people are pitching these things. You want to ask, are they fiduciary? Do they have your interest in mind? Because for me, if they're not asking about where is your 401k, let me look at that. Where is your, um, do you have uh, other uh, retirement accounts other than your company? Let me look at that. Uh, you know, do you have other stuff set up for your kids or whatever? Do you have a trust and a will and all those things? Those are the types of things that they should ask because they have, that has, those questions have your interest in mind. And when you think about ethically, when, when they're selling you that, if you don't have all those other things covered, you don't need life insurance. So, or whole life insurance, you need life insurance for your whole life that determines cash. So it's just that, and the returns aren't that much. If you ask them, where can I get better returns that are safer? And there are, there are better returns. You don't need the middleman. They should tell you the truth. And if they don't, this is where you want to ask, is this person a fiduciary? Does he have my interest at heart? Or he has heart of his company than his commission structure? So. Our heart commission structure. So this is, I, I wanted to point this out because a lot of people have this misconception and a lot of people in the Sikh community and in the Punjabi community have these policies, which they are getting no value from. And the value that they are getting, our community is so jaded that the value that they are getting to think is great when they're thinking like, hey, I made, like I said, I showed you in that example, hey, I made $645,000, but yeah, but 
if you did it the right way and you had a fiduciary working for you, you would have made 800 something. So the 600 might seem good and the whole life insurance like, yeah, but I made some, but yeah, but you missed out on another 20, 30%, which could have been yours at a lower cost. So those are the types of things you want to think about. Uh, and this is why I wanted to point this out, just because I see it everywhere in our, in our community. All right, so I know time's running out, so let me see what can you do today right now. So my advice is check your 401k plan by your employer. Make sure you're in index funds. Check the fees, the turnover rates. If you're in a target date fund, unless it's Vanguard, you need to move it to an index fund right away because you don't need that many funds. A target date fund has like 20 funds in it. You only need a couple, uh, which I'll show you soon. Uh, if you have a match, definitely do the match. That'll help you if you have... If they're matching 3% or 5%, you put the 3 to 5 or 6%, whatever they're doing, because that's kind of the it's like 100% return on your money, and, and you're putting it in, in, in uh, 401k. So that's good. Look into IRAs. Look into other retirement accounts, which you could invest in, and it could grow tax-deferred or tax-free. A couple of these are the open uh, Roth IRA, which you could open in Vanguard today. You pay taxes now, but the cool part is if you withdraw them, and there's limits to it on your salaries, which you guys could read but uh, there's no taxes when you withdraw. So if you put 50,000 in now and you withdraw 150,000 in your 401k, you gotta pay taxes on the 100k, right? The 100k of the gain. But in IRAs, you don't have to, it's tax free. Uh, traditional IRAs are, uh, because they tax you in your 401k, you get taxed up front. Same thing with traditional IRA, you're getting taxed up front, um, uh, upfront tax deduction, and you're gonna pay those taxes on withdrawal. So. Um, Look into Roth IRA, traditional IRAs, other places where you could put your money. What funds do I recommend? These are the Vanguard funds. These are the funds I have. I don't have any other funds. So this is me personally too. This is, you could go in and, and check these policies online. But there's a 500 index fund, which I have in my 401k. Uh, we have the total stock market index fund. So let's say you want the return of the total stock market, the 33,000 funds. You just want a piece of each one of those stocks in an index fund at the lowest cost. That's what a total stock market index fund is. A Vanguard Real Estate Investment Trust Index Fund. These are, I don't want to get into it, but these are, uh, we don't have time, but these are real estate. There's funds that only focus on senior real estate development, commercial, those malls that you guys see, the people that own that. And there's an index fund for it, and they give a lot of dividends. And those, those are for people that want dividends. And these are great for your retirement accounts because you're not going to pay capital gains on in, in, in retirement. So that's something you want to look at and be part. International stock market, if you want to be part of that, because they have all the international stocks in the world. You could get it in one index fund. So you could get a piece of the world in two index funds, the total stock market and the international total. Um, and then there's a bond market. If, uh, you know, if you're older and you're thinking about retiring in 10 years and you want stuff in bonds but don't want to pay the high bond prices, you get the total bond, uh, uh, total, uh, bond index fund. So things to leave you with is, you know, hopefully you can educate yourself a little, know your risk tolerance, markets going up and down. Can you stomach it? Like I said, it's about behavior. It's not about you want to, when the market goes lower, it's great because you're purchasing more shares, right? At your dollar cost average. When the market goes higher, it's like, it's okay. Uh, you're still putting money in, but you don't want to worry about the ups and downs if, because you have a long-term strategy. Got, decide on your asset allocation, set up automatic investments from your bank account, Monitor the performance. If you need help, consult a, pro a professional advisor, but a flat fee only advisor, because that's a fiduciary. You pay them a flat fee. There's, they don't get commissions or any of that. You pay them like whatever it is an hour and it helps you with and advising you with your funds. Those are the best fiduciary advisors out there. Uh, in my opinion, there's also uh, a fee-based advisor, which uh, you know helps you uh, take your funds and put in their company and, and their fiduciary as well, but uh, they grow with while well, you grow. But if you just want one time advice to just get all this stuff set up, flat fee is the way to go. Um, so like I said, some, some things that are not investments, and I just pointed out the whole life insurance stuff, but also gold and silver, you know, in stocks you're investing in companies and their earnings, like investing in Apple and their iPhone growth and their sales and all that stuff. Metals are just metals. I know our community is big on gold and silver, but they're not really investments. They're really speculative investments. Like when things are really rough, the gold prices go high because of some speculative thing that the market is saying, then they go low, 
they don't give you any dividend, right? There's no asset, there's no corporation, there's no business growth. Those are all speculation. So you, those are not investments. I'm not saying don't have them. I'm just saying, but don't, these are not real investments that are going to help you create wealth. So uh, we, we have some time for a QA. and oh, I hope this helps. I hope you guys look through this at a sick angle and know there's companies out there that ethically and morally are doing the right thing for you. Um, and I gave you one in Vanguard and hopefully you guys will check it out and see what you can do. Hopefully you guys could go back into your investments right now, check out your fees, ask your advisor if they're fiduciaries, do they have your interest in mind, what is their commission structure, things like that. So you are getting, you know, you are, your hard earned money is working for you. All right. So with that, I guess we'll take some questions. If there's any. Oh, see, there's a lot. Go ahead, Govind, do you have any quick questions in mind or you want me to just read them? Um, so, Manpreet, I think uh, you covered uh, some of uh, these earlier, but let me just uh, go back to... Oh, and then there's one thing I want to mention too is in, when it comes to the fund and donation and, and you know, as part of our Sikh heritage of doing it, um, one of the things I told my wife was, you know, once we have all these shares of these index funds and you could do it through the shares of index funds or individual stocks, whatever you have, you could donate it too. So let's say I want to donate money to Sikri, right? And which I do every uh, month, but let's say I want to do another donation. I could actually give them my stock. I could have given shares of my stock to these companies. I'm sure there's other Sikh organizations and maybe other organizations, Salvation Army, whatever you want to give to that will take shares of your stock, which is which helps in two ways. It helps you because, of course, you gave your this one, but it also helps uh, it, it helps them get the gain. So if your stock is 50 bucks and you're giving it away at 100, you have to pay capital gains on 50 50 dollars, right? But now you don't have to pay any because since you're giving it to uh, a 501c and a nonprofit, Uncle Sam doesn't get that money. They could get the whole value of your capital gain. So it's a great way to build wealth and give it away to uh, as part of our lunch sucking thing. But sorry, go ahead, Govinder. No, no worries. Thank you. For, uh, that was a very uh, good information uh, session. So there was a question, and I'll cover cover some of them. And I've sent you one, but um, there was a uh, question about timing uh, with the presidential cycle coming up. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, is uh, Harjit Singh from Brooklyn ask uh, if I'm going to uh, invest uh, for the first time in Roth IRA? Should I begin before or after the presidential election cycle? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, so great question. I have no clue. And Harjeet, let me tell you, nobody has a clue. So, but what you want to do is if you, so let's say, I don't know how old you are, but let's say the, you're under 55 and the Roth IRA is, you're opening it up and you could put $5,500 max a year in a Roth IRA. If you think it's going to go up and down, first of all, that's like market timing. So I don't want you to get into that because your Roth IRA, you're not going to cash it out till 60. So it doesn't matter if it goes up and down. But if you just want to hedge your bet a little safely and had had your thought a little and your uh, so your emotion, you could put just a little bit in now. You could put a little bit in after the election. So let's say you put let's say you put two thousand in now, and uh, or or a hundred dollars, whatever you want now, just a little, just to see where it's going. And uh, if it goes up, then maybe you miss that gain a little. But if it goes down, then you're okay because. Uh, you still have a couple of thousand that you didn't invest that you could put in now. So dollar cost averaging, like I said, is the safe way to get into it little by little if you're not, if you're uncertain about the markets. But if you have this mindset of doesn't matter, I'm going to, in my Roth IRA, I can't cash it out till I'm 60 anyway. Like I said, I don't know how old you are, but I can't cash it out till I'm 60 anyway. Let me put all of it now. Whatever happens, happens. Uh, the re dividends will reinvest in its time. And at the end, you're, you're going to make out great either way. At the end of it, at the end of 10, 20 years, it's in there, you'll make out great. Thank you. Um, Ish, um, Ish or Isha Singh uh, from London had a question on taxes. Give me one second. I'm just trying to pull that up. So 
can you shed some light on how investment income like stock gains or losses um, is taxed at what rate as part of income? Yeah, so it, de it depends, um, you know, capital gains, it depends on your income, but it's usually 10 to 20% knowing short-term capital gains or long-term capital gains. But an index fund, if you have one, so the capital gains on mutual funds are a lot, right? Because they're buying, they're churning over the stocks, they're buying and selling on all those gains, and that's going to be going back to you to pay those capital gains. On an index fund, there are no really capital gains because they're not buying or selling everything. You're going to have that S&P 500 index. The turnover is going to be really low. You're hardly going to pay capital gains. But I do want to say on taxes, um, this is why Wall Street makes out really well and all these big uh, money guys make out really well because the tax rate's really low. So it's not your income tax. Capital gain tax, depending on your income, your situation, when you did it, short term, long term, it's going to be around 10 to 20 percent. Thank you. Uh, thank you for covering that. Um, now, I did see a couple of questions from uh, a couple of the audience about the recording. Yes, uh, this webinar is being recorded, and you will get an email with the recording link within seven days. Um, um, a follow-up question from uh, Ish was, uh, is it easy to invest in Vanguard from uh, England, from London, England? Um, I don't think so. I think, uh, I, I, I don't think so. No. Um, like, I, like I said, I apologize. It's very, um, it's a very American focus, but I don't think Vanguard's international like that. Um, I might be wrong, but according to me, when I, I used to go to London a lot for my work, when I asked about that, a lot of people told me no, but I'm not, I'm not a hundred percent, but, uh, either way, try to get low cost. Uh, you know, London had a big index fund documentary, actually, that I saw. So try to get, I'm sure there's some equivalent or something like that there, which you could get your hands on and do, uh, and, and get into a fund through a London-based company that has Vanguard funds or something like that. That you could, you might be able to do, but I don't think Vanguard directly is there. And I think you covered part of it, but uh, Tejveer uh, had a question from London is, I have a work pension plan uh, with the company Aviva, and the advice that has been given is to invest in high-risk stocks early on in life and then bonds later. And uh, yeah. second... I, I do agree with that, yeah. Okay. I do agree with that advice if you could stomach the risk. If you're one of those people that are going to look at it every day, oh my God, stock market is down, what do I do? And you might be vulnerable to pulling out, then don't invest in high risk stocks, invest in moderate stocks. But it's all about what you could tolerate from your stomach. You know, when the stock market for me goes, and then bonds you want later for sure. Like my parents, like I said, they're in bonds because I want to, cons all the wealth that they made that they worked so hard for, I want to conserve it. Because when they need it now, they can need it. I'm not trying to grow it no more. We already had 30 years of that, right? So, uh, with them. So yes, bonds, I do agree with later. I'm not saying put a hundred percent in bonds, have like a 50, 50, 60, 40, something like that. Always have some stock in there, not a hundred percent in bonds ever. Uh, because, uh, and then risk stocks early. Yes, I do agree. But an index of them, not individual risky stocks, but an index of an high, high risk stocks that will, uh, be diversified for you. And that will um, help you uh, early in, in your life when you're trying to accumulate wealth. That'll help you. But again, it's all about your tolerance. You know, I have a friend that, you know, she makes a lot of money too, but she didn't want to go aggressive. And she's my age. She's like, oh, I don't know if the market goes down. I'm like, don't worry about it. Do what you want to do. What, whatever makes you sleep at night, do it. If, if high risk, you could sleep at night, well, do it. But if you can't, you might want to lower it. That's all. And I think uh, some people have touched upon this. Uh, thanks for answering that. Um, uh, some people have touched upon it, um, including Jatinder uh, Singh Hundal from Sacramento, California. And he says, is it better to buy a single stock um, or the new way of buying buckets of stock like Motif investing? Um, do you yeah. have any preference for one way or the other? Yeah. So, you know, I like Motif investing, actually. I do. But um, if you know things... If you have, uh, I don't want to say extensive knowledge, but if you've done your research right and you could stomach things, Motif Investing might be a good way to go. If I, everyone on the webinar, Motif Investing is basically, you could create your own little mutual fund. And, and I think it's a bucket of 30 still that you could create your own little fund and put like $100 in and it'll spread your 
like, uh, accordingly too. Um, it's it's kind of risky, and you could take part in other people's uh, uh, motifs or mini mutual funds. I'll just say that they built, and you could take part in them. If you know a lot about stocks, uh, I think buying individual is great too. I think it is. I think it's the way. I have a couple of individual, right? But uh, I don't have anything for my parents like that because they're very diversified. Uh, but I'm very diversified too. But I do have some part of my portfolio in individual stocks. Um, I think it's great. I think it's great to give it give it a shot. But I'm also uh, just to give you you know uh, uh, one financial advice, one financial per- personality, which is really good. He's all into dividend stocks. He's like, it's, I'm only going to buy dividend stocks and this and that. And when you, they were interviewing him, he's like, is all your money in there? He's like, no, I have index funds too. Just in case I'm wrong about certain things, I have index funds to fall back on. But I do have some dividend stocks that he invests in. So just uh, just make sure I would just, my, my opinion is, just make sure you have, you're diversified in that way too. But if you know a lot about stocks and you believe that and you have the research and time, then Motif is the way to go. Uh, for most people, though, buying an index weekly, monthly, and putting money in would probably be the best bet they could have 30 years from now. Because remember, you're acting like a mini money manager when you're doing Motif. You really are acting like a money manager. And in a period of 10 years, 95% of money managers, and this is the this is Google facts. Go ahead. In a period of 10 years, 95% of money managers cannot beat the market. So if you're a part of that 5% that could beat the S&P 500 index in the 10 year span, go take a shot at it. Risk, you know, you live life once, do what you want to do. But these are just the facts that you want to be aware of. Thank you. Um, and then uh, I think you touched upon this, but uh, Rupinder uh, Singh uh, from Jammu asked, is trading recommended as a, uh, as per Sikhi or only long-term investment? You know, it's a good question. I am not uh, policing that in the sense that I think if you want to trade stocks, go ahead, trade stocks. Because some people, that's their, uh, I'm not saying they're bad because that's their everyday butter. You know, like that, there's traders uh, that make a lot of money, they lose a lot of money, but that's how they feed their families too. So, I'm not saying it's against the key or for the key, but if you're trading with technical knowledge and this is where you think uh, the game is played, I don't see a problem with it at all. But if you're trading as you're betting and hedging and you're not ethically earning certain things and getting insider information and doing those types of things, then obviously it's against, right? But um, uh, if you could do it, I, I don't I don't see any harm in, in trading. Uh, but trading is, um, if you're if you're not in it 100%, it's not a great long-term strategy. Meaning, if you're not going to do it for the next, you know, 10 to 20 years and give it your all, then I don't think it's a great strategy. If you're if you're eventually going to do it for a year, uh, it might it might turn bad for you. You know, because when the market's going up, trading is great. That's when everyone's a trader. But when the market starts going down and there's a crash, suddenly people start losing their shirts. So if you could stomach all that and you know where it's going, then by all means, I don't think it's, I don't think it's good or bad, but it's just uh, it's obviously high risk. So uh, I think we're done. Hello? Okay, so uh, I think that's it in terms of questions. I appreciate everyone's time. Um, If you want to reach me, uh, I had my uh, Twitter handle up there, but if you want to reach me, it's just my, um, you can reach me through the Sick Research Institute. They'll give you my email. Uh, If you have any other questions, I'm happy to help out. Don't worry about my time. Like I said, this was part of my just fun too, so. Uh, thank you for your time today. Why did you call us? Why did you give us
Ei, rolando, não, não. 